Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker J.B. Stout. My first exposure to J.B.'s work was in one of the knife magazines ages ago, then through Instagram. But as soon as I got the Boker Lateralis in hand, uh, I was totally hooked on his designs. Since then, I've been drooling over his signature Fuller and Future Classic, almost Art Deco style. And at Blade Show 2021, I finally got a chance to get one of his custom creations in hand. And I was totally blown away with how solid and hard use these elegant tactical designs actually are. Whether a slip joint, a fixed blade, or one of his signature locking folders, you know a JB Stout knife when you see one, and I can't wait to dig in with the man himself. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos. We have Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. If you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. JB, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Thank you. Hey, so uh, like I said up front, I'm a real, real fan of your designs, and uh, they really show, you know, a, a sophisticated style and and something that's been labored over for years. But why don't you tell us where this all started? How did you first become a knife guy and a knife maker? Um, since I was a little kid, man. I mean, uh, just playing with knives, seeing uh, ninja movies, that type of thing. Uh, that led me down the road of martial arts. Um, started out in karate, like like most most kids do, and that type of thing. Uh, then got into uh, aikido, uh, uh, swordsmanship, you know, iaido, all that stuff. Uh, and I think that helped influence my designs in a way because first and foremost, you know, I look at things for what they are. Um, it, to me, there's always a weapon aspect. Uh, so when I design a knife, even even if it's a, a skinning knife or something like that, where I know that I'm more likely um, to be attacked by a wild animal <clears throat> than I am a human being. So uh, even if you're, if all you have is a skinning knife when you're in the woods, you know, if, uh, if a white tail gets pissed off and comes at you, then you know, whatever. Uh, that's more likely to happen in the real world than to have to use a knife as a weapon on the street. Um, so that got me into it. And when I was a kid, I think one of the, the first things that really influenced me, um, I don't know if you remember like the old Lone Ranger episodes, uh, okay. you know, uh, <laughs> Tonto uh, had, had, a, had a cool knife, you know, and that type of thing really appealed to me. And of course, you get these little toy sets, you know, cowboy and Indian type things. Um, and my dad actually used to make me these wooden knives. So the place where he worked, uh, like at his lunchtime or whatever, he would go into the shop and make like these wooden knives uh, that looked pretty realistic, you know. So I grew up playing with stuff like that. You know, that led that's led to guns and, you know, everything else that goes along with that. Um, I didn't really ever have an interest in making a knife until my 20s. Um, I was working in a I'm a tool and die maker by trade. I uh, started doing that back in 97. Uh, I got out of school for that, like 95. Uh, and the story this is the story I use all the time. Uh, I was working in the shop and there was this, uh, this old man that used to come in there and borrow 
uh, my boss's shop, you know, to, to, to work on his own projects, stuff like that. And he was a retired machinist. And um, anyway, we were back in the back of the shop and he was grinding on uh, some like deer antler. And it was just making me nauseous. Like the smell, the smell of deer antler grinding is, it's, it's, it's fucking terrible. So uh, I finally went up to my boss and I was like, Hey man, I, you gotta tell us gotta leave. Like this is really getting on my nerves. You know, I got a lot of work to do. So uh, the guy, the old man gets done with the knife, you know, and we're sitting around, I think it's like lunchtime. We're sitting around and uh, <laughs> he hands me the knife. And it was basically just an antler with a blade that he had purchased from this place called Dixie Gum Works that sells knife kits and stuck the handle, you know, stuck the blade in there, glued it in. And so my boss was like, hey, what do you think about that? You know, I just think that's cool. And I was like, actually, I think it looks like shit, to be honest. You know, because I, I, I wasn't even I was into knives, but, you know, coming from a machinist background, that type of thing. We're, we're far away from antlers, you know, with a file stuck in it you get what i'm saying yeah so so it was basically like he you know he was like well do you think you could make you know and i was like i don't know never tried so the very first knife i made was made out of uh d2 steel and i milled the bevels on a bridgeport mill i had no idea how to make a knife and that's so why i approached it strictly as a tool maker i just tilted the head on the bridgeport you know nice. uh, like eight degrees or whatever that's how I milled my bevels. And if if I had to say, describe what it looked like, the, at the time there was a, uh, I think a guns and ammo magazine lay on the table. And I'm almost positive it was a Strider knife that was on the cover. Okay. And so I look, it's, to me, that that was awesome. You know, I look, I was like, this is a knife. This is what a knife should look like. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, at that time I was, was, wasn't into Loveless style, things like that yet. So, Anyway, I built this knife, and uh, you could have very well accused me of, you know, tracing a Strider because that, that's exactly what it looked like. So the next four knives that I made like that, they look great, man. I mean, I mean, I don't know what would have happened if I would have just continued down that path and doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that, I started researching, and I was like, oh, this is how you make knives. You got to have this kind of grinder. You got to. You gotta, this is this is how they do it. This is how you haul grind, this is how you do this. So my next hundred knives, and I'm not exaggerating, my next hundred knives that I ground look like absolute dog shit. I mean, I'm just being honest. I mean, they the 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 four that I milled look like I'd been making knives for a few years. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I learned from scratch in this way, you know, the working by hand. Um, so I made a, a bunch of knives like that. I ended up selling a lot of them on eBay, actually. Uh, this is around 2000 ish, somewhere in there. And, uh, I actually put the whole thing down for a while, probably five, six years. And then, uh, I came back to it, um, because I had started to appreciate like Loveless style knives, uh, classic styles that, um, a lot of people do them. There's only a handful of people that do them right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and I really got obsessed with that kind of world of knife making where it's like, you must do this. You must, you must do your grinds this way. You got to do this finish. You've got to do all these things. And what I was really enjoying looking at though, was makers like Phil Hartsfield, mm -hmm. who was doing, you know, they were doing chisel grinds with, 60 grit belt and and i'm like well wait a minute so this guy's doing this his knife performs better to be honest um it's way more practical why isn't this more appealing to people because i'm still in the machinist mindset um it, if you came to me like if a company came to like a, the shop i was working at and they said hey we need to build a cutter or a knife that cuts paper all day long Okay, or or cuts cuts whatever all day long. If I sat down and, and designed a die or a machine automated machine that would do that, the blade that I would draw would be a chisel ground blade. It would be right. it would be flat on one side. It would have a sharp angle. 
because it's easier to maintain. So when the thing does begin to dull, you know, uh, a tool maker can take it off, set it up on the surface grinder, regrind it, sharpen it, put it back on, we're good to go. So when you get down to the bare essentials, that's it. A chisel ground blade with a zero edge, that's all you're ever going to need in your whole life. So like a, a Japanese style kiridashi, something like that. Uh, they designed that knife for a reason that way. Uh, it's kind of primitive, but you know, and a lot of people say, well, they use them as a marking tool. So you can put a scale on something and you've got that flat edge and it's easier to make, you know, make a straight line. They use them in horticulture, you know, cutting flowers, that type of thing. Bottom line is that knife outperforms everything else. And, and, the, and you can't argue that, you know, there's, there's all these, well, a flat ground's better than a hollow ground, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's get down to the bare essentials of it. A thin, uh, very sharp angle, that's a knife. That's what cuts. So a lot of a lot of your knives these days that that uh, that you see reflect not only that the chisel edge, which I'm a I'm a big fan of a chisel ground blade, uh, but also right. you can see a lot of the uh, history of the milling uh, process in the blade, yeah. the, the fluting and in, in the bevels and that kind of thing. Is that a style that emerged, or is that uh, what do you make of that? Um, it's just something that circled back around. So. When I actually started making knives kind of seriously, um, I guess this was 2007, eight, somewhere in there. Uh, when I started making them seriously, like I said, I was into Loveless stuff, uh, Heron. I mean, uh, you know, makers like that, that all kind of built that kind of knife. And I, the more I found, and I did everything manually. Like I, I didn't use a mill, I didn't use, uh, you know, I just had my grinder, drill press, uh, very basic tools. And I started to realize, hey, I'm just doing what I think people want. You know what I'm saying? I'm not doing what I really like. So once that clicked in my head and uh, I, a friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Horton, um, another maker that I do a lot of collabs with, he's one of the first people that was like, hey, man, you know, you, you're good at what you're doing, but do what you want to do. And the truth behind that is you can, you can make knives to, to make people happy for a long time. And you can do that. You probably make a living if you want to, or just as a hobby, but until you start doing what's inside, you know, your art and that way people can look at it and they go, I like this or I don't. Hmm. Yeah. And that's just the bottom line. That's the bottom. I mean, they're, they're either going to like it or they're not. So, I want to, I, my goal was to create a style of mine that I don't have to put my logo on it. That's what I want. That's what every knife maker should ultimately want is to have a product so that when you, you know, when you hold it up, they go, okay, I know that's a stout. Okay. So if I, if I, if you take a Strider, an Emerson or Chris Reeve and you, you put them on a table, uh, any, knife any knife collector maker whatever worth of salt is going to be able to go that's an emerson you know that's a chris reeve that's a strider they don't have to see the logo they may not even have to open it because that style is so distinctive they know what it is as soon as they see it that should be the ultimate goal you know for every maker um so at some point you know i started making what i wanted to, and what was coming out of me was quote unquote tactical knives. Okay. Or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call that. Okay. Um, and I started getting more attention. You know, I started getting more people calling me and be like, Hey, can you make this for me? Uh, I created a lot of that to being on the USN, uh, usual suspects network. Um, I'm not really as active there as I used to be, but I met, you know, 50% of my current clientele there. Um, so that was a big step, you know, cause people were like, Hey, I, you know, have you seen this? Whatever. Um, so that's what, where I kind of got started on it. And it was really started out as a hobby because being a machinist, I was, I was running wire EDM machines, high stress stuff where, you know, a lot people don't realize like a wire EDM. I'm, I was the last 
guy in the process. So this dude has spent, you know, 30 hours milling it, putting holes in it and doing all this stuff. Then we've got another, you know, 10 hours of water heat treatment. And I'm not talking about knife blade stuff. I'm talking about big stuff, you know. Yeah. So by the time it gets to me, there's already thousands of dollars in this job. If I screw up, it's my fault and it's yeah. all gone. It's all for nothing. So um, I had to do something else. So I would come home and I only used a drill press in my grinder. I was like, I'm not going to use a mill. I'm not going to use a mill. I'm going to do this stuff the old way, you know, not forging. I don't do that. But the more I did it, the more I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> Why don't I just use my to, skills, this is stu it's stu Yeah, it's stupid for me to try to do something outside of my skill set, okay? Um, and I tell that, like, you know, we'll talk about this later, but I have the knife dojo class where basically a couple guys come stay with me for the weekend. We They walk out of here with a knife uh, right. that they built from scratch. Uh, they do the grinds. They do everything. Um, and I, I tell people this in my class, you know, uh, and I try to implement some of the things that I've learned over the years, not just from knife making, but from being a tool maker. And one of the things that you learn as a tool maker, the first thing we eliminate is a bandsaw. Okay. So, you know, that's, that's one, it's a safety hazard too. It's a time waster in my, that's, th these are my opinions, of course, but sure. If you work in a tool and die shop and you're quoting jobs, you know, it comes in, they're like, well, we could saw these or we could have more jet or we could do this or we could do. There's so many other options now besides the old bandsaw. Right. Not saying it's obsolete. There's still things to do. Uh, so that started to curve my process of I started thinking more like what I am, which is a tool maker. OK, I'm not a uh, I'm not an Amish cabinet builder. Mm -hmm. I'm a, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have a problem with technology, okay? Uh, the steels that we're using now, okay, you, you can't say that you want to be primitive and everything or you want to do everything by hand, and then we're, we're sitting here having steel debates. You get, well, so. uh, let, me, let me just interject something really quickly. I think it's interesting um, that you were making loveless style knives, and uh, to me, you know, if you don't know what a loveless, you know, Bob Loveless, he was, he was the guy who started the Knife Makers Guild, I believe. And he was a, a serious bladesmith who who created who was responsible for a number of classical knife patterns that yes. are repeated over and over and over. And to me, that's like that's like I mean, I say this a lot here, but it's like the great American songbook. It's like the songs that, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra sings. Do you want right. to try and be a Frank Sinatra or do you want to try and be your own? You know, and, and you already had that machinist and tool and die maker background it makes sense that right. you would find your own voice using those machines right and and robert loveless is still one of my heroes always will be because just not not just because not just for his work his philosophy the way he the way he approached knife making the way um he describes the feeling of being a knife maker um, I think one of his quotes was, you know, when, when you pick up a knife, there's something primitive there. There's a, there's a feeling and that's, it's real. You can't, there's, there's a, there's a feeling you get holding a live blade. Um, and he, this is really debatable. I mean, people who are experts on Loveless will tell you that he wasn't as great a knife maker as he was a designer. Hmm. And because his, his designs are, you, you can't beat the four inch drop hunter. When it comes to a skinning knife or whatever there you can do it a whole bunch of ways and you can add things to change the shape or whatever but when it comes down to it that blade that shape that hollow grind you can't get anything better for doing the job that it was designed to do that's what tickles me okay that's what gets me going it, it, because as a designer as a tool maker i look at the practicality of something and how can we improve on this thing and usually it's going to end up being pretty fucking bland. Okay. So if you think about necessity and what, what works and what doesn't, it's going to end up being kind of bland. That's where the art part comes in. And you have to, you have to make it attractive. You have to do something that, that, that people want. Some people have that, some don't. And that's just the way it is. And, and I was, earlier when you mentioned the art deco thing, um, mm -hmm. 
that's one of those things that I, I kind of came up on accident. I started putting that pattern on my knives and a couple of my maker friends were like, once you do something like that, you can't quit doing it. So you get what I'm saying? So once a person sees that and they're like, man, that's pretty cool. I haven't really seen that anywhere. Fucking do that. Just yeah. keep, keep doing it because then you become associated with it. And there's nothing wrong with that when you're doing what we do. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it also adds. Hang on, hold that thought for a second, if you don't mind. It also adds yeah. dimension to to the kind of work you're doing. I mean, you're right. doing t tactical knives. You're doing knives right. that you said there's always a weapon DNA in the work you yeah. do. There's always a weapon, a bit of weapon genetics in any knife that I'm attracted to too. But but it also has to have something unique to it, something, uh, and right. and that and that style that you put in there adds dimension because it's not what you might expect in a robust, somewhat tactical design. Right. I, I think the reason that I started doing uh, like uh, I brought a few things here. I'll I'll show yeah. them throughout. But this is my Blood and Thunder V1. And that's my flagship. I mean, this was the first design that I came up with that looked like something else. You know, it didn't didn't look like it was copying anybody or, or tracing another design or whatever. Um, I like plain tie. I like flat scales. I don't really like to contour for a, a variety of reasons. So I had to figure out something, you know, to break that contour. And, I, and I'm just doing, you know, radial chamfers you know, around the perimeter so that when it's in your hand, it doesn't feel like flat scales. It feels like, you know, there's, there's some different shape to it. It fits in your hand better. Uh, and like I said, that, that's where that weapon part comes in. When I grab a knife, I want to be able to just squeeze that thing as hard as I can yeah. and it not dig into me anywhere. So even with the frame lock, with the clip being there, this thing feels like one unit to me. Okay, so that that's what I want, and I want that that comfort in you know no matter how you hold it, that's that's what it's got to feel. So every time I design something, first and foremost, it it's got to do that. It's got to have that feel in my hand, or I've got to start over. You know, I got to do something else. Um, that that's where the design part comes in. Again, there's a lot of makers that are awesome makers that suck at design like they've got the skills they've got the techniques they can they can mirror polish something but when it comes down to design it's like that looks like a rectangle bro it's like you know what i mean it's like uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we gotta have some curves in there so uh and then there's guys that are opposite i i, I know guys that are awesome at designing and they suck at making knives so uh it goes both ways but if you're gonna do it for a living kind of got to do both you know yeah. uh, <laughs> so so the the uh the one knife but besides the ones i was pawing at uh, blade show 2021 the one knife of yours that i've had real long time exposure to is the lateralis first of all it, right. it drew me in because of the name i'm a big tool fan and exactly. uh, <laughs> I, presu I presume that's where you got the name um yeah. but but also um it it, it is um I don't know all of the dimensions and uh, what's the word, but like the proportions of that knife really, yeah. really makes sense to me. It's uh, and, and then just having it in hand, it just, it's, it feels great in hand. I think that's a lateralis right. on the lower right. Is, am I correct there? Yes. Uh, yeah. I actually have the, uh, here's one of the Boker ones. Um, this is the one with G10 and it was one of my first uh, flipper designs. And I really didn't want to go down the flipper road, but um, you got to it. So you got to try everything. But again, same thing with this knife. I mean, no matter how I hold this, um, I, I feel like I could, you know, stab something with it. Um, and, you know, that that's, I think when you design something that way, everything kind of falls into place, okay? You get people talking about, uh, you know, handle to blade ratio, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I, I'm really a stickler about, okay, I want, you know, of course you can't do this, but I want the blade, to, I want it to look like a fixed blade. 
Okay, that's what I want. Uh, without, and I'm probably going to, this is where I cross lines. I don't want to see an exposed day <laughs> I don't want to see, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to see anything in the tank. I, I want this to look like a fixed blade when it's open. Okay, and that's, that's personal preference. It's all good, but I want, I try to minimize as chop as much stuff down as I can to get to that point. So, wait, uh, I'm sorry, uh, back up a little bit. You don't want to see an exposed detent. Do you mean like the hole on the outside of the lock bar? You don't want to see. No, like no, 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 no. That, that's, that's fine. I mean, well, like on this, you know, this is a production knife. They don't, you, you don't really see it. Um, on all of my custom knives, I'm going to have that. Uh, you can see okay. it right here. Um, because maintenance down the road. So if I got to change out a detent ball, whatever I got, I'm talking about when you open the blade and on the tang of the blade, you can see the actual detent hole. I got you. Because, because, and I understand the design aspect. I understand they're trying to minimize this distance. Right. That's cool. You know, if that's what your goal is and you're cool with that and people, you know, you got customers, that's great. Me personally, as soon as I see that, I walk away. I don't okay, know what it okay, is. Okay. Okay. So you're saying you want the blade to handle ratio to be as close to one to one, but without seeing the internal guts yes, of the thing. Yes. Exposed. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Huh. I, I actually want that blade to handle ratio. Like this, this is a blood and thunder fixed blade. So, you know, the blade is, you know, whatever length and the handle is obviously shorter. I would love to have that. And we can, if we fold it and the tip hangs out, that's cool. Yeah. Know? But that's what we're that that's what we're shooting for. Okay. That's as a designer, that's what you want that look. Okay. Because it's sim it's 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 what we see. It's symmetry. Uh your eye sees that and automatically, especially if you got any kind of eye for design, um, you're gonna look at that and be, you know, especially if you see a folder where the blade could be a half inch longer, you know what I mean? And you look at that and you're like, What what were you thinking there? Like Let's, yeah. let's, let's get maximum blade. Um, when I first started designing, I, I would actually have a problem every once in a while. You know, people would like reach down in their pocket to get yep. their knife and their finger would go in there just a little and it poke them. And to me, I was like, okay, so what's the problem? Like, you can... <laughs> yeah, right. You're getting a little more blade, man. Yeah. My, maybe my fingers are more calloused or something. It doesn't bother me. I don't know. But, um, so I, I, you know, I was like, all right, go cool. on grind it back a little, you know, if you need me to. So, so with Boker, you had the lateralis first, then you had the Leviathan, right? Another yeah, folder. Yeah. yeah that's and, uh, this one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, which has kind of the, a similar, well, it has the same design language in the handle. It, it has yeah. a, a similarity there. And then uh, now you have the Omerta, Omerta, yeah, the dagger fixed blade. Um, yeah. I actually have one of those. And uh, so this is just my take on. I don't know if you remember, like the uh, the what was the oh, the, oh, the like the slip daggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, OSS. That, that, yeah, that type of thing. Um, no guard. This is last resort stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's it's yeah. a, um, and the Omerita thing just kind of goes along with mafia type stuff you know uh actually the name is from a lamb of god song if you like lamb of god okay the song america uh that's what all, all most of my knives are named after some metal band song that, that i like okay um pretty much all of them so uh this you know i did i, I did probably i don't know 15 or 20 of these custom uh before you know, Boker, <clears throat> they hit me up again. They were like, well, what do you think about doing some fixed blades? And I was like, yeah, let's, let's do this first. And let's see how it goes. Let me see let me see what you can do as far as quality. Because I thought if they can do a dagger grind yeah, and pull that off and everything looks good, okay, we'll move on to something a little more, you know, intense. So, Well, how, how were they with taking a dagger? Because I would imagine their market shrinks with a double edge. Um. Yes and no. There again, that's where the name comes in. Uh, they're not having problems selling these. I mean, uh, it depends on the name behind it. Obviously, mm -hmm. the old okay. the, the Sykes Fairbairn dagger that's never going away. They, they'll be right. they'll sell that thing forever uh, because you can't. There again, we're talking about a classic design that you can't really improve on. Uh, 
Right. Um, that's why I went a different direction. I was like, if I put a guard on this, if I do this, it's going to end up in that same fold. I try to stay away from that as much as I can. So um, I don't want to, you know, piss in someone else's pond, as they say. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even, even I, I've, I've come to accept now that it's like, you're going to have haters and you're going to have super fans. The only people you should be worried about is your fans. And that's it. Like, because uh, I mean, every time I design something, there, there's a little bit of, uh, what kind of flack am I going to get for this? So, yeah, it's like the first nah. time we did it. First time we did a 60 grit grind. I already knew, you know, there's going to be people on it, the internet that are going to be like, oh, that's stupid or well, blah, blah, tell, blah. Tell, tell listeners what that, what that actually means. Okay. So, uh, usually when you're grinding blades, you're going to start with, you know, the lower the grit, the rougher that is. Okay. So a lot of guys won't even use a 60. They'll start at like 120, 240, 320, 400, whatever. Um, I rarely go past 220 because I like a plain satin finish. That's my favorite finish. And usually I, I tumble everything. So uh, that's that's my personal taste. I don't like mirror polished blades. Uh, they look like chrome rims from the 80s. And to me, that that's that's what I see. I mean, I, I just I don't like it. So but I appreciate it. Like, you know, I understand the skew. I understand what goes into it just not for me. So why would I produce something that I don't like? Um, so actually that started as a joke. Uh, me and my friend Horton, again, we were, uh, I think making knives for blade show one year. And I was like, Hey, what if we ground a blade just with 60 grit? See what you, you know, see if you can do this. Uh, the difficulty behind that is obviously is your plunge. So uh, let me find something with a nice sweep. So like this blade here, you know, it's got a, a nice sweep in the plunge right here. And this is a 220. This is a little skinning knife I make. Um, if you do that with a 60, it's going to, you've got to really spread that in. You know, you got to start way down here, bring it in and, and make it flow right. Um, the other, obviously, the other thing with a 60 grit or 36 grit belt, there's more surface area. Therefore, you might have to deal with rust down the road or, or uh, whatever. Me, I don't care. I mean, I do spa. I, my warranty is absolutely free. Uh, you, you get rust on your knife or whatever. And as long as you weren't like swimming in the ocean with it, I'm going to fix it for free. It's not a big deal. So it really doesn't bother me. Um, same thing with the milled bevels. I mean, you know, this is way rougher than 60 grit. Right. So yeah, is that one of those? Yeah, you can see that when you tilted it that way, you can see the grooves in right, that in right. that uh, from the milling, yeah. and that's just raw I, right there, right? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, most people the first question is, "Well, I bet that affects how it cuts and blah blah blah." No, it doesn't. It does not. It, not at all. The edge cuts, not the bevels. Um, it might affect <laughs> trying to slice off a piece of Velveeta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. that, it yeah, might slow it down a little there, but as far as like cutting what people usually do, which is envelopes and occasionally sharpening a pencil or whatever, um, come on, let's, let's be serious here. Um, th th these not most custom knives now are 80% art, and yes, people who, yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, if people can't admit that, you know, if they're like, well, my knives are only for utility and so on and so forth, okay, cool, well. You can go to Walmart and get that all day. You, you can go buy a $20 knife that will last you the rest of your life if you take care of it. You can buy yeah. if, if, if you're if, if you're, you're buying a if you're buying if you a JB can, Stout custom knife and using it for you and that's your utility knife, man. Yeah. You're either a very bold soul or you've got a lot of money to just sort of Yeah, well the, the, well the thing is, I mean, you know. I, I, I use the analogy that modern modern folders in the art world are akin to single action army pistol revolvers uh -huh. because most people who own a Colt single action army revolver, they sit around twirling it, fanning the hammer back and forth, dry firing it, 
that's what they do 90% of the time. They're not shooting it all the time. Right. So guys with custom knives, they're sitting at home in front of the TV doing this a hundred <laughs> times a night. Okay. So that's, that's why the maintenance on you're taking a risk right there just by selling it. Because I dude, I know people personally that, that drive their vehicles, flipping a knife back and forth open. Okay. Things like that. I literally open my knife maybe once or twice a week. And that's no joke. The knife that I carry to work with and everything. And most of the time I open it like this, that slow, that methodical, that's how I open a knife. Okay. But we have to overbuild them, you know, for people <laughs> who are, that's part of the game though. I mean, you can't, yeah. Yeah. you can't tell people what to do with their property. <clears throat> and, and, and if you, if you sit down and said, okay, well, I'm only going to warranty knives that I know people were just open, like normal use. How can you measure that? There's no way to monitor that. Um, so now, now get, don't get me wrong. I've, I've had some come in and you, you take it apart and open it. You're like, what the hell happened here? Right, or right. maybe they sent it, they sent it to a pimper, pimper screwed it up somehow, things like that. But yeah. My my warranty is if it's been cracked open and played with, warranty boy. If if you send my knife to a pimper and they mess it up, then no. Right, right. Yeah, that's your business. So uh is that the same instinct? Is that fidget instinct? Uh the the element that sort of pushed you into making a flipper with the with the lateralis? Yeah, uh and that and just so many people were messaging me like, I'd like to see what you, you know, what your take is and how you approach doing a flipper, that type of thing. Uh, I actually had another, not the parabola, which is another tool song. Um, I had that one first and that was actually my first flipper. Um, but I didn't think it was quite, could be quite as commercial as like the lateralis. I hate to use that word commercial, but it, it, it is what it is. Um, oh, yeah. I, I figured the lateralis would be more appealing to, to, to the majority. So that's what I kind of have to look at. Um, I really don't like taking an exact custom design and 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 making that as like say a boker, like a hundred dollar knife. Mm -hmm. So I always change a few things up, you know. Um, as far as a mid tech or something like that goes, if I was going to do a mid tech, I would do a completely different design. Like I wouldn't do that as a custom right. because the price range is getting a little bit too close to custom. So. So you've you've worked with Boker on a number of designs. Obviously, you've got yeah. your own you've got your own thriving uh, custom shop. What about um, what about collaborations with other knife makers? You've done quite a few. Oh. Um, uh, yeah. What's what's that What's that process like? I would imagine with Boker, you kind of it's a back and forth. You tell them, uh, you know, you give them the design. They might have some suggestions, and then you settle on something. But what is yeah. it like working with another knife maker who is, in essence, another artist? Right. Um, that's one of the things I live for. Um, to, I mean, the best way I can put it is I only collab with people I respect, for one. Uh, I don't do collabs because I think it's going to boost me, you know, make me more money or something. Um, it's got to be somebody I respect. It's got to be somebody who has a design that I can look at and say, I can do something with that. You know what I mean? Like there's some designs I look at and I'm like, dude, I, I can't do, I can't put my flavor on that. I, there's nothing I can do to make that represent me in any way. Um, I, dude, I've, I, I've collabed with, uh, Jeremy Horton, Brad Blunt, Sean Kendrick, uh, Shannon Kendrick. Carter, uh, Shannon Carter, he, he makes like a flipper dagger. And as soon as I saw that knife, just the shape of it, I was like, dude, I think I can do something. So I, I called him up and I'm like, Hey, you want to do a collab? And of course he was into that. Uh, Jim Burke, I've done one of his knives, McGinnis, Lee Williams, Billy Cho. Wow. Uh, I've done, uh, of course, Chavez. Uh, Ramon Chavez, you know, the Megalodon, that was, that, that's my design. And then Ramon produced them, um, which 
that that was one of the my you know I've got my I've got I love all my collabs, but you know some of my favorites were Ramon. Uh, dude, I've done nut collabs. Uh, I've, what do you mean? I've done, you know, like Nux. Like uh, here's oh, a Nux. Uh, got you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here's here's a Jamie Williams, and you know that's that's me on 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 his design. Um, I did one with Andy Frankhart. Uh, the thing with Nux, the reason I ended up making my own is because I've got these freaking <laughs> giant fingers. <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't get the fucking thing on my finger. So I, I was like I was like, well, I don't want. You know, they don't have to change. So I ended up making my own design that actually fits. And, uh, you know, this, this one has a bottle opener face, which would make a pretty good wound channel. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. But my, my only uh, claim to how can I do something different? But, dude, if you sat down and design a nook, you're not going to get far from this. You're not going to get far right. from this. You're not going to get far. That, that works. You know what I'm saying? That actually could be used. So I just put a quick detach in it. So, you know, I machine that in there. Uh, you can buy these quick detach swivels. You can you put that in a key chain, whatever. Um, I had to do something different, right? But uh, those are all the guys I've collabed. I've collabed with guys on tools. Uh, obviously, me and Horton have done. Me and Jeremy Horton probably, you know, probably, some people probably think we're in business together. Like, like, we, <laughs> like we work out because we've done so much work together. Um, and I've even collabed with tools with, uh, like, uh, Ryan Thompson, who used to work for Arizona custom knives. Oh yeah. 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 We did, uh, this whale tool and, uh, it actually has the Arizona custom knives logo on it. Um, a friend of mine named Barry Schwartz, <laughs> we, uh, we came up with this one and it's basically the star of David, you know, and, uh, we call it, we call it the star of Barry, the SOB, uh, so, I mean, I've even collabed with, you know, friends and, and customers and that type of thing. And uh, as far as, you know, tools, like, that's what that's another thing. You know, me and Horton, we came up with this. This is the Clam Master. And uh, <laughs> the reason behind it is there were so many, the, you know, bottle openers and things that were phallic. Yeah. You know, the best way I could put it. Yeah. We decided to do something a little more feminine. And uh, we came up with this, the clam master. Uh, this is kind of my, my flagship tool. This is a Broner. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and then I started doing these uh, these round tools, which these also have a quick detach. And this is called the Piston Han Bro. Oh, that's um, pretty cool. Know, like the Nintendo game, you know. And actually yeah. one, of my custom, one of my customers, I did a, like a contest and he named it. But again, even with this tool, what does this remind you of? It's 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 a coupon. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you got that on your keychain. You hold that in your hand, and you know, that's there you go. So you were you were talking at the beginning at the at the beginning of the show. You're talking about how every knife has a weapony aspect to it yeah. uh, that that you design it, and that's my approach. And uh, I think you and I might be of the same uh, era or generation. When I was growing up in the in the 70s and 80s, all the all the male characters had a belt knife and I was like, well, that's right. what it means to right. be a man. You have a belt knife. And, right. yeah. and uh, that's always colored my, my view of things. And, and, you know, even, even slip joint knives. Um, yeah. I, I look at them as, Hey, your slip joint knife, that Hawk build knife. Um, I can't remember what you call it now. The sparrow. The sparrow. Maybe? The sparrow. Yeah. Yeah. That thing is not only beautiful, but it's also menacing. I mean, you you you, right. you managed to make a little slip joint knife into a menacing kind of a creation. That was that was the idea. I wanted um I did a collab with a guy named Jeff Rojas, and uh, he's actually the guy that does all my logo designs. He's in the Philippines. And he is actually a there's a lot of these guys that you know claim to be good with karambits and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. This guy studies this shit every day of his life. Okay. That's what he does. And that's, that's that he was grown. He grew up that way. Um, so me and him designed a knife called the Nighthawk, which I, I don't have one with me. Um, and I told him, I said, look, I want you to design this thing and I'm going to put my flavor on it. And, uh, you tell me why I want to know why, because being a martial artist years back, I want to know what's behind the weapon. Okay, because 
people don't realize that like a katana, a wakizashi, and a tanta, they all have three different jobs. Okay, they're three different blade lengths, they're for three different things. So why what what why a karambit? Why that shape? Why this? Why that? I want to know what's behind it because I think I always thought karambits were mall ninja, silly. Mm -hmm. This makes no sense. I, I totally get it at close quarters fighting. It's it, I get it. I, I understand the mechanics. So I wanted him to, to go with something. And that, of course, his first thing was, it's going to be a karambit being in Filipino martial arts. And I was like, I can't do that. Maybe we can go like Hulk Bill type. Yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like, he's like, okay. So I learned so much from him telling me why why the blade is this long, why the handle is shaped, why the handle is this short, mostly because they have small hands. Um, but the blade is a certain length because in a certain width, because you want it to go into the eye. You you gotta be able to fit it in places. You gotta mm -hmm. be able to fit it in you gotta be able to fit it in certain places if you're actually fighting with it. So I let him run with it and then I changed a few things and we did it as a fixed blade and a forward. Um, but I tried to stay away from that type of knife as much as I can. I just think it's there's so many people doing it, like the rain fighters, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I never have done one of those. Not that I I'm against it as a weapon. I kind of, you know, I, I kind of get it, but come on, we got to carry this stuff with us too. And um, so on that same subject, uh, one of my collabs that I did was with, uh, again, with Horton. And he was making these trench knives that I really liked. And I was like, okay, I dig that. I've got to do, I got to do a trench knife. I got to do my, my version. Uh, so I came up with this one. And this is this is oh my trench knife. Oh my god! Oh my god! And, that's uh, so cool. I've, you know, see, these are milled bevels. I did I did the Duraco, uh, the whole deal. And if you notice, these <laughs> obviously the knuckles they have to fit me. Okay, yeah. I couldn't, uh, you know, do it and 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 not be able to take pictures with it or whatever. Um, so that's my trench knife. And that's so cool, man. Yeah, and this one, you know, this is like 95% CNC mill. Uh, pretty much every bit of this is, is machined. Um, so then, uh, you know, we got to talking about doing a, a new fixed blade. Well, Horton does this knife called the Rollout. And what it is, it's a Persian-shaped blade. And at the time, oh, I was yeah. watching, watching the show Taboo. And I was like, you know, the, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but yes. the knife, yeah. So the, the two knuckle karambits that he was using, I, I saw that and I was like, fuck, I got to do that in a Persian. <laughs> it's like, it's, like the first, it's like the first thing I thought. I was like, I've got to do that in a Persian. So I messaged Horton. I was like, hey, what do you think about this? And of course he, you know, he's obviously like, yes, let's do that. It's actually designed for this carry okay that way your 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 punching knuckles are you know exposed more um and it's designed so that you know you can you know if you hit something your knuckles never get touched okay so because of the guard and that this is the kind of stuff that i design and i'm this this makes me live it's like <laughs> yeah you know what i'm saying this, this is what really you know gets me going well, you know, before you pulled the trench knife out, knife out and and the rollout out, I was gonna say, you know, you really sneak in the 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 weapon aspect because your knives are so, forgive the term, but they're very pretty. You know, they they're beautiful knives uh, in their own a, way. Yeah, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in their own way. You know, they're uh, maybe yeah. they're handsome knives, but the the point is like. You don't look at them and think, "Geez, that's a deadly weapon." You look at them and think, "My God, that's a beautifully designed." knife and uh you know and then when you actually hold one you're like damn this thing's solid as a rock and yes it can right. be used as a weapon um and and i think to me that sort of subtlety is important unless you want to be known as a as the weapons guy but and then you pull out those two knives and man yeah those yeah. those are just uh yeah when awesome. i get an when i get an idea for design like i said my first thing is is practicality and it kind of leads me just like that that taboo knife um 
the first show we took that to actually, and, and of course, you know, the way Jeremy grinds, uh, he does a, a really deep chisel grind and you won't find a sharper knife. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the way he sharpens his knives, it's, it's scary. So, and when I had him on the table, it was at the uh, Fort Worth show in Texas, uh, this past year. And, uh, we had them on the table in sheaths and I kept noticing people would take it out of the sheath. And then when they, when they went to, uh, to stick it back in the sheath, they were like, they were kind of scared. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> it was yeah. so sharp. And so, so pointy. It's like, eh. so I ended up just taking the sheaths off the table. You know, I was like, Hey, if you want to pick it up, play with it, go ahead. Right. But, uh, but Hey, mission accomplished. That's, that's what it's supposed to be. That knife's not good for anything else, but once you look at it and, and think it's made for. Right. So that's it. That's it's not good for anything else. I mean, you know, we you know, take that fishing with you and you know <laughs> scare the hell out of the fish, they jump in your boat. Yeah, yeah. So what so the this process, okay, um, you're you you're collaborating with a another knife maker. Do you ever run into uh well, you said you only really collaborate with people whose design sense you already resonate with. But I mean, uh, how does that work? Do you decide who's going to design the knife and or the blade and who's going to do the handle? Or is it is it do you take right. a pass at the whole thing and pass it back to him? Or how does that work? Uh, some some knives like say uh, like the knife I did with Jim Burke, the uh, Apollyon knife he does. Uh, McGinnis. I did a knife with McGinnis. Um, let me think Billy Cho's knife and uh, Shannon Carter's knife. I basically took their knife and just put my, my milling and stuff on it. And some, and some of those I ground the blade too. I did my own grinding. Some of those like that. Now guys like with Horton, Blunt uh, and Kendrick, we designed something from scratch and, and we sat down, we get an idea. It's like, Hey, let's take your uh, whatever uh, blade and put it in my whatever handle. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that looks. If we can do something with that, and then we may have to tweak it. And then at the end of the process, we may come out with something that doesn't look anything like we wanted, but it's fucking cool. And so we we just you know leave it at that. Um, it's really the thing I really like about collabing is uh, one I always learn something. Uh, even if I learn what not to do, you know, I mean, that, that happens. I'm sure it happens when some guys collab with me, they're like, well, I don't like how he does this. So I'm not going to do that. Or, and that's all good. That's, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, we come up with something we want and we think is good. Um, but yeah, the collab process to me is, I think it's important also, uh, because I, most of the collabs I've done, I was able to work with somebody that was way above my skill level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the whole point of that. Just, just like, uh, with Blunt, for instance, um, he was at, after me for years, like, Hey man, you need to start making slip joints. Cause he got into slip. He's just like me where we kind of got that attitude. We see a gadget we see something. It's like, I got to do that. And I'm going to be obsessed with that for months. <laughs> I'll quit doing everything else until I figure out how this fucking thing works and how to make it my own. Okay. So I kept avoiding, I was like, dude, I'm not doing slip joints. I'll be, I'll be stuck on that shit for a year and I'll go down that rabbit hole. I, I'm not ready. So I made as a joke, I made this little bitty frame lock that I called the slick leg, which again is a mastodon song, but okay. if you want to look at it, if you want to look up the Urban Dictionary for sleep leg, be my guest. Um, so I'm, it was it's a frame lock about this long, and I was like, I'm gonna do this, but I'm not doing any fucking slip joints. I'm not going. I'm not gonna make grandpa knives. This is what I called them, you know. Right. So so for some reason I don't know what it was. I got to looking at something and I was like, shit. How does this work? <laughs> so 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 I go buy like this cheap. Uh, not really cheap, you know, like a case uh, side busters. I don't know what the fuck it was. And so I just I take it apart. I'm like, how does this work? I'm trying to figure out the mechanism. And I'm like, screw this. So I call Blunt. I'm like, let's do a collab. We're going to do a slip joint. 
I want to design it. I want to design the, the, the basically the perimeter, the shape. You do the mechanics and you teach me how to do the mechanics while we're oh, doing this collab. Cool. Yeah. So that was the best way for me to learn. Okay. So I'm basically, I designed a knife and I, I sent it, you know, he looks at the draw and he's like, yeah, yeah, we can make that work. We can actually, what you've drawn, we can turn, you know, some stuff you can't turn into a, a slip joint just right. because of mechanics. Yeah. And he's like, dude, that's not a bad idea. Cause my thing was like, here's the, uh, the possum slip joint that I did with Horton. And my thing with slip joints, I'm picky about little shit like this. Like, you always have this sticking mm -hmm. out, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I always hated that. I was like, that is, why do we have to, you know, what's, what's the deal? Well, you can't really pack the kind of blade you want in there and, and have that stuff without doing that, right? So the first one I designed had a guard in the frame that covers this up when it's closed. And like that was a called the dead, Yeah, and it's called the dead horse. That's what, the, what we named the, saw, the, the, the knife. Um, and everybody was like, holy shit, you know, that's, that's cool. We haven't seen a design like that. I'm like, dude, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I just, this is where we're at. So, uh, so then we, after that, after I learned how to make them, I got obsessed that I, I've got six models now of, of slip joints. So uh, what, this is my, my biggest one. This is called the Poon Buster, um, kind of off of the, you know, the name Sod Buster. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's just that. a big har harpoon bladed, you know, slip joint. Um, That's a beauty, man. Thank you. And then this is the possum slip joint, which you know, uh, me and Horton's uh, biggest collab is the possum, and so we basically put the possum blade in a slip joint. In a slip joint. Well, so okay, yeah. this is so collaborations are a great way to learn from some masters, new stuff that you haven't. So uh, as we wrap, tell me about this blade dojo. Speaking of learning yeah. and teaching and all that. Um, the whole idea behind the blade dojo was uh, I had so many people like new, like you're always getting um, new makers. A lot of times will come up to me at a show and I used to do the same thing. Uh, and they'll hand me their knife and they'll be like, Hey, fucking lay it on me. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do? I found that 90% of people don't want to hear the truth. You know, they, they, you know what I'm saying? Because yep. sometimes, sometimes I'll grab a guy's knife and I'll play with it. And I'll like, I'll be like, do you really want me to tell you what I think? The guys who are like, yes, please fucking tell me those guys usually end up being successful and they go down the right path. The guy that you hand that you know hands you your knife and you're like, uh, you need to do something about. Well, I've seen blah blah. blah. I've seen one of your knives, <laughs> and I'm like, hey man, you asked my fucking opinion. Yeah, you. Asked. I've made I've made every mistake that you're ever gonna make. I've screwed up every screw up that you are going to screw up. So when I give you my advice, it's based on the fact that I already fucked up. I've already been there. I've yeah. already sent that knife to a customer. I've already got that knife back and had to fix it. I've already, you get what I'm saying? I've already yeah. done these things. I didn't have anybody to tell me all that stuff. Like when I first started making knives, I didn't even have the internet here. I was, I was just blind. The first folder I made, I had never picked up a custom folder. The first show that I went to was Blade Show 2013. I had never been to a knife show in my life. I bought a table. And I sold out. So I've made all those stupid ass mistakes. That So when a guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, how come uh, my blade keeps getting off center? And I did this. I'm like, okay, do you have a service grinder? Well, no, I just did get a fucking service grinder. I, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being practical. So the worst thing I was seeing was horrible construction. Like, guys that were basically starting out making folders and they never made a fixed blade. Hmm. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm sure there's some anomalies that, that have done well. The majority of dudes that I, young guys that I saw making folders that never made a fixed blade, they didn't understand basic construction, parallel, perpendicular, square, all the holes have to be, everything's got to be right or nothing's going to work. 
So if you can't put scales on a fixed blade right, how the fuck do you expect to make a folder that's going to that's going to work right, right? So the knife dojo started simply because of that because I was kind of pissed off about it. I'm a little bit of a troll. Like I would see stuff and I'd just be like, I, dude, I, I I get kicked off of blade forms a long time ago because <laughs> you know somebody posts something and I'd be like. Or, you know that's fucking stupid like you've been doing this for 20 years and you don't know like basic fucking machining or whatever but uh, that's just you know i do shit like that anyway um so i was like okay i gotta do something i can't just you know tell people hey you're screwing up and so that's my way of helping okay i mean i, I charge for the class so obviously i've got to buy materials and you know all that kind of stuff and most people are fans, but every once in a while, there's a guy that comes in that's, that's ready to start making knives and they want to learn basics and basic things like making your material square, all that stuff. So we start from scratch. Um, they bandsaw the blade out, the profile, they heat treat the blades. And the way I do it so that the, for time can, heat treat is time consuming, okay? Heat treating one knife blade out of D2 or some nice tool steel takes all day. Okay. It's it's not like you see on Forged and Fire where they've got a fucking, you know, perfectly hardened knife in an hour show. That's absolute bullshit. It, it doesn't happen. So uh, heat treating takes a day, even if it's one knife. Okay. It takes approximately an hour to austenize that. That's bringing it up to heat, to maximum heat, and then quenching it. And whether it's in water, plate quench, or whatever. But the tempering process, every knife I do usually gets a two to three hour temper twice. So by the time you're done heat treating, that's an eight hour day. Yeah. So obviously we can't do that in class. So what we do is each class heat treats the blades for the next class. So everybody makes the blanks and everything, but their blanks go in the oven. They get to learn how to heat treat. They learn all that. But the blades that they're going to make their knives from are blanks that the last class made. That's smart. Okay. Yeah. So everything in my shop is I've got an awesome hard uh, rifle tester. I've got all that stuff, all the QC stuff. So we know everything is right. Um, but once the student comes in and we start making scales and we start drilling holes and we do all that stuff, fitting up scales, uh, blade grinds, I don't allow tool grinding. And I know people are going to be like, well, you chisel grind sometimes. Yeah, I've been doing this shit for a while. That, but I want you to learn yeah, yeah. How, to, how to do it this way. So then you later on. Chisel grind out of choice, not out of necessity. Out of choice. I want you to learn the right way to do it. I want you to learn how to bandsaw these blanks out. I want you to know why it's sometimes better to water jet. I want you to learn all that hard shit that everybody has to do. Okay. And so they end up making a knife, sheath, everything, usually Kydex. Um, and I haven't had a single person walk out of here not happy, like not just like ecstatic that they built something by themselves. And uh, the only thing that I do, like when it comes to grinding, if I see that they're making like a terrible, like this is fixing to be a problem, I'll step in and I'll be like, okay, let's correct this grind before, before it gets out of hand. Uh, but other than that, I turn them loose. So I feel like that's a really valuable uh, service um, that you can offer people because, um, I mean, you were talking about the Internet before. I mean, with with the Internet and with how the knife world has exploded and people yeah. have people's expectations are extremely high uh, because they've been exposed to so much that uh if you are an aspiring knife maker and you set off and you and you make a couple of, of wrong moves up front man your name's going to be plastered everywhere as that guy That's whose right. knives are off center or whatever it is and you might not have a chance after that so i think that's a pretty it's a great that, service that's a thing too but at the same time i think it's valuable to fail at the beginning because you need a customer to say hey man Hmm. This this doesn't look right. Um, and then what makes you a good person, what makes you a good maker is to say, I'll take care of that shit right now. Send it to me. I'm, I'm going to take care of it. Send it back. you got to make mistakes. And it, I've got uh, actually, you know, a young maker that is starting out. And he asked me, he had, 
asked me that same old question. He's like, hey, I got this. I made my first knife and this guy wants to buy it. What should I sell it for? I'm like, dude, the knife is worth whatever the guy's willing to pay. That's all I can tell you. Hmm. Now, you have to make a moral choice on if you think it's worth that. You know, how do you want to start this game? Yeah. Uh, but I said, the thing is, get your knives out there. I don't care if they've got little mistakes here and there. I've got a bunch of knives out there from 20 years ago that I would be embarrassed to yeah. see now. But guess what? None of those dudes are calling me up and going, hey, this this, this knife looks like shit, man. I want to yeah. want you to, re you know, that doesn't happen. I mean, uh, you you got you got to be you got to accept some failure. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Uh, well, so what's what's the next dojo date, and how do how do people um, get involved if they want to uh, be a part of this? Yeah, so the way I do the knife, obviously, it's been an issue the past year with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, people are a lot of people are afraid to travel. It's just like shows or anything else. So it's been on hold. Uh, I didn't have any classes last year because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a, a Facebook group called stout knife dojo and uh knife is spelled k-n-a-f um stout knife dojo uh so basically you send a request to join that group you get in the group you see what's going on you look at pictures and whatnot and basically what i do everyone who's in the group i put I, i've got your name on a list and let's say i'm gonna if i was gonna do one two months from now i'll post in there i'm gonna do a knife dojo on this date, two months from now, who's able? So you'll ha I'll have three or four people be like, I can do it. I, that date's good for me. And we go from there. It's kind of a first come, first serve. Okay. okay. Um, but because people have so much shit going on. Yeah. And I, the way I set it up, um, it's really set up for a maximum of three people. Uh, but I have done two, you know, if, if I had to or whatever. So is the Stout Neff Dojo also where people should go to kind of get keyed in on how to actually acquire one of your knives? And No, um, that's uh, that's Stout Knife and Tool. Okay. It's another Facebook group. That's where I do my lottos and everything else. Uh, for people to, who don't understand the lotto process, the way that works is I don't take orders anymore. Um, there, I do have a few people on my order book. Some of those guys have been waiting four years. But there are people I know, they're my, you know, a lot of them are my friends, and they don't care because they want to see what's coming around the corner sometimes. They're like, I kind of want this, but I saw this, you know, picture you posted the other day, and I kind of want to see how that goes. But um, so the way the lotto process works is this I make a knife. Uh, sometimes I make a folder a week, two folders. Sometimes I do fixed blades, tools, whatever. I post pictures of it in the group. And I basically post how much it's going to cost. Uh, the lotto, the rules are usually you get one in or sometimes two. Uh, you basically just type I'm in or whatever. Out of all those num all those people, I put it in random.org. We pick a number. That person gets to buy the knife. Uh, so it's just like show lotto. It's just like beat, beat lotto at, at a show. Right. Um, it's the fairest way. <laughs> that I can do business because there's there, I've seen those, all those mistakes made where a maker might sell to a particular guy over and over because that guy's paying a premium uh, that turns people off. I've seen all those scenarios play out and I'm happy with my table price knife, you know, however many of them I make, that's how I make my living. So the Lido was the fairest way for me to do it. And uh, the people who do get on my order book spot, I still am not going to make probably exactly what you request. You know, I, I when I started out, I had to do that, right? You know, you, you've got to find out what people like, that type of thing. But now if a guy calls, you know, on my book, and he's like, yeah, man, I want carbon fiber scale with a silver twirl bolster and, uh, you know, some gaudy, crazy yeah. shit. You know, I'm going to stop him and be like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nope. <laughs> Got the you wrong tell me guy. What, you tell me what model you want. Uh, do you want to go dark or do you want to go satiny? 
do you have a special material you'd like me to use? So if a guy wants a Mokutai scale or something like that, he sends me the, the material. I make a scale, uh, his scale. I get to keep the rest of that material. You get what I'm saying? I'm not going to, yeah. if a guy's, yeah, you know, so let's say my table price is $1,000 and a guy wants a Mokutai scale. He can buy that Mokutai. I'll get a couple parts cut out of it. I'll make his knife with it. And he's not going to pay much more than the table price. But I can take that other piece of Mokutai and I'll use that later for an open bid or something. Right, so right. I'm going to, that way it works out well for everybody. I'm not going to get a piece of Mokutai and be like, Oh, that's going to be an extra thousand, bro. You know, for, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, but materials don't cost that much. So, <laughs> well, you know, that that uh, that lotto uh, does seem like a fair way to do it. I mean, I remember yeah. when I was first exposed to the lotto thing, I was like, oh, this means I win a knife. No, it means you win the spot to buy the knife because there are a lot of people who want to buy that knife. So, uh, well, OK, right. tell everyone, remind everyone again where they should go. Uh, on Facebook just to be as keyed into your work as possible. Okay. Uh, my Facebook group is called Stout Knife and Tool. And all you have to do is find the group, send a request, and either me or my admin will let you in the group. There are rules uh, on how to act. Uh, you fuck up, you get booted. Simple as that. Um, you want to see pictures of my work, go to Instagram, JB Stout Knives. I post pictures every day. Um, that's the best way to find out what I'm doing on Tuesday or whatever. Yep. Uh, and that's usually an indicator of what's going to be the lotto this week or, you know. You've got a great account. I love it. You, you're so, you're so regular on that account. It's, it's, uh, it's great to follow. JB, thanks for uh, so much for coming on the podcast. I've really uh, enjoyed talking with you and finding out about your work. Like I said, I've been, I've been just admiring it from afar for so long. Uh, it's great to finally meet you. I appreciate it, man. I really do. All right. My pleasure. Take care, sir. You too. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, J.B. Stout. Uh, we were just talking about the lotto at the very tail end to get his handmade uh, knives from his custom shop. But uh, if you have an appetite for a J.B. Stout design uh, uh, and you want it right now, check out his Boker designs. He's got three uh, knives with Boker, and they're all awesome. Um, I'm really uh, I'm really psyched about this Omerta because, you know, I've been in a dagger phase lately, so I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Uh, check out all the other podcasts we have here. Every Sunday we have an interview uh, with a knife maker, manufacturer, martial artist, military guy, uh, reviewer, what have you. Just uh, someone from the knife world uh, making this, this whole hobby exciting. Check out Wednesday so you can see the new knives I've got and what's new out in the industry, and then Thursday Night Knives, my favorite time of the week, where we just get to hang out and talk knives. All right, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.